Good morning. Good morning. Only a few words to welcome you here on behalf of the scientific <coughs> committee of the 27th annual colloquium on violence and religion. We would like to thank each of you for attending the cover to um, 2017 at the Universidad Francisco de Vitoria. We appreciate your taking the time and effort to be here. We also thank you for your participation and sharing your ideas and expertise with us. We certainly hope that the conference is being all that you expected it to be and that is bringing you the opportunity to make new friends and renew all acquaintances and to have discussion and exchange of many experiences, suggestions and opinions. I also would like to apologize for my absence from yesterday's opening sessions as my agenda did not allow me to be among you. We are truly convinced that this will be an excellent opportunity to recall and update the thinking of an academic who was being char characterized by his openness to debate and discussion. <coughs> we are pleased to continue in developing René Girard's mimetic model of the relationship between violence and religion in the genesis and maintenance of culture. I like to warmly welcome you to Madrid and to our university and please enjoy the cover. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Is this, is this audible? <laughs> it's a huge pleasure to be introducing two good friends of mine, Joan Cesar and Carlos Mendoza. Joan is going to speak first. He will be known. with René Girard and Pierre Paolo of Evolution and Conversion. But in addition to that, he's an extremely distinguished Brazilian academic, currently uh, battling heroically with the powers that be in Brazil in order to preserve the university, the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. He's also the president of Abralic, the Brazilian uh, liter literary associ association. That would be, what, what's the equivalent in the American equivalent? It would be the ATLA. ATLA. The uh, Atla, the American Association. Um, there is a very small list of American universities in which he has not been a visiting professor, but I won't shame them by, uh, uh, by reading, reading them out. He's the author of many books, and many people here are expecting uh, with excitement the translation into English of his book on Shakespearean cultures, which has already made a great impact amongst Spanish-speaking and other Latin American followers of Girard because of its reading of the way mm -hmm. in which uh, non-hegemonic cultures have become mimetized following René's reading of Shakespeare. So it's with enormous pleasure that I turn the floor to my friend Jean César. Thank you. Gracias, Carlos. <coughs> uh, good morning. Mm -hmm. I would like, first of all, to Thank you, Professor Angel Barona and all the organizing committee for this invitation. I'm very proud and very happy to be here. And I would like to say that uh, yesterday, while when uh, Professor Goodhart asked the, all of you to introduce your, yourselves, I was very much impressed by the variety, by the interdisciplinarity, and by the rich approach to Juha's work. In that sense, I would like very much to also congratulate Professor Barahona and uh, James Edison, a dear friend. This is a fantastic organization. And I'm very happy to be here also with my good friend, Carlos Mendoza Alvarez. What I will present today is a summary of a book that uh, Bill Johnson has been generous enough to accept in this very important collection on mimetic theory published by the Michigan State University Press. The book, as James said, has already been published in Spanish, is coming out n next month in Portuguese, and hopefully by the end of the year in English as well. Three yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a double, but a triple. <laughs> triple. 
and then I will basically present today for our dialogue three concepts <coughs> that I have proposed in this book. The concepts of, of Shakespearean cultures, collective interdividuality and poetics of emulation. And let me start in Maria Res. To define the concept of Shakespearean cultures, let me evoke my Paul's novel, The Mimic Man, the title of which already suggests a Jihardian reading. While reflecting on his experiences, the narrator, Ralph Singh, native to a Caribbean island and exiled in London, identifies a key affinity with, as he says, a young English student. This is very important as it clarifies that his dilemma is not exclusive to the exotic condition of an intellectual from the, from the periphery, but rather it refers to anthropological circumstance affecting all, and says Ralph Singh. He was like me. He needed the guidance of other men's eyes. Farther, farther onward, the narrator defines the mimetic nature of desire. We become what we see of ourselves in the eyes of others. Those affected by this existential condition are relegated to a sort of half a life, always hanging on the opinions of the rest, very much like Shakespeare's characters, as keenly characterized by René Girard in a theater of envy. The playwright came to develop a precise semantic field to define the centrality of the other in shaping desire. And I quote Jihar. Shakespeare can be as explicit as some of us are about mimetic desire. And, uh, and Shakespeare has his own vocabulary for it, close enough to ours for immediate recognition. He says, suggested desire, suggestion, jealous desire, endless desire, and so forth. But the essential word is envy. Alone or in such combinations as envious desire or envious emulation. End of quote. The topic, the topic structures Shakespeare, Shakespeare's theater. In Julius Caesar, when Cassius seeks to involve Brutus in a conspiracy to assassinate Caesar, Cassius poses a decisive question. So tell, says Cassius, tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? Brutus' answer is an essay unto itself. And I could say that my book is a footnote to this answer, says Brutus. No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself but by reflection, by some other things. The formula is perfect. The eye cannot see itself in the absence of a reflection provided by a surface external to the subject. Naturally, Cassius offers himself as a mirror for his friend, and convinced of his worth by the gaze of the other, Prudus finally joins the conspiracy. In the Shakespearean universe, Similar passages are legion. King Lear, maddened by his daughter's ingratitude, he stumbles across the Count of Gloucester, blinded under torture by Reagan and the Duke of Cornwall. His comments amplifies the notion presented in Julius Caesar. Says Lear, what, art mad? A man may, may, see, may see how this world goes with no eyes, look with thine ears. To look with one's ear, that is, to rely on an outside source to identify one's own, own desires and uh, one's own ideas. Here lies the power of the worldview held by the altar of Macbeth. Looking with one ears entails withdrawing the autotelic dream of absolute autonomy from the modern subject at the very moment of its emergence. Let me now propose my first hypothesis, which I, I will still unfold. Shakespearean cultures experience 
the mimetic force of desire on a collective level. And this is the main point. They need a model so that they may finally behold their own face, not on an individual level, but on a collective individual level. The same structure is to be found in, Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's comedies on the individual level. In the first act, the third scene of As You Like It, Rosalind and Celia almost have a falling out over the, former, over the former's sudden infatu infatuation with Orlando. However, she believes she has found the perfect formula to avoid conflict, and says Rosalind, let me love him for that, and you love him because I do. To desire or not to desire, that is the Jihardian question par excellence. To love someone based on another person's interest or not to do so for precisely the same reason. But in this context, how to avoid the maddening consequences of Gregory Bateson's structure of the double bind? Or is it a matter of accepting to experience desire or half a desire, shall we say? Half a life is the title metaphor of another novel by Nepal, in which an identical dilemma faces Chandran, a character who happens to meet the, the British writer Somerset Morgan. Through a series of revealing cultural misunderstandings, the English writer takes the bombing for a wise holy man, since he speaks infrequently and monosyllabically. And impressed by the encounter, the English writer mentions Chandran in one of his novels. That's all that it takes for Chandran to become famous for having been written about by a foreigner in Curtis's, J.M. Curtis's mischievous summary of the plot. The new literary celebrity starts to receive, this new literary celebrity he starts to receive visits from tourists and he's left with no choice but to play out the story narrated by the author of The British Agent. Despite the awkwardness of the situation, this involuntary alchemy leads to a sort of backwards conversion. As the character says, as the narrator says, soon he came to believe his own lies. The Brahmin's road for, to fame was not without certain obstacles says the character, it became hard for me to step out of that role. And uh, you just got it. This role was created by the eyes of the other, which the Brahmin was forced to accept. And says the character, I recognized that breaking out had become impossible, and I settled down to live the strange life that fate had bestowed on me. Here, fate has a name the gaze of the other. And since the foreigner is considered an indisputable model, he is lent authority to define whatever lies before him. An expected Adam, he is tasked with the naming, bringing words and things together at last. It is, however, worth repeating. Shakespearean cultures, I propose to, your, to our dialogue, experience this dilemma on a collective level, a circumstance that makes this problem even more complex. An urgent question emer emerges. What strategies can be developed to tackle this challenge, the challenge of my Mises? Of course, this model of cultural history is not easily limited to Latin America, as demonstrated by Naipaul's and Curtis's novels and essays. But out of a methodological concern, in the book that James Ellison has generously mentioned, I have first developed this theoretical framework, thank you, within a given horizon, the horizon of Latin American cultures. Latin American countries, particularly in the wake of 19th century romanticism, have, defi have been defined by, a, by the foreign, foreign gaze, 
as if they were objects in an exhibition wherein curator and viewer were one and the same, to wit, the European traveler. The viewer has always been a foreigner with her authority deriving from, from her otherness. That made her into model to be imitated and never questioned, much less emulated. This tautological mechanism remains in place to this day, and one of the aims of the essay that I have just finished is to call this circumstance into question. In order to unfold in this possibility, I have proposed a new concept to mimetic theory's arsenal. I refer to the concept of collective interdividuality, the consequences of which are potentially important to the cultural history of the continent. The transposition of the mimetic nature of desire from the level of the inter interdividual to the collective was obsessively, obsessively worked over by the broadest variety of Latin American thinkers in the 19th and 20th centuries. Interdividuality, as you know well, is the only ne neologism that Chihuahua introduced in formulating mimetic theory. Individuality is not defined on an autonomous basis, rather it depends on interaction with others and is by definition intersubjective. Hence, in place of individuality, says René Girard, we should use the notion of interdividuality. René Girard introduced the concept of interdividuality in De Choses Cachées depuis la Fondation du Monde, but the very basis of, of it was presented in his first book, Mensonge Romantique, Verité Romanesque. It is the mal ontologique, which signals the ontological precariousness of the self can, can, that can only understand itself through the gaze of others. The frame, this framework of the mimetic subject, I would say, is more contemporary now than it was in 1961. Girard offered a precise definition in dialogue with psych psychoanalysts says Girard, that is to say, the mimetic point of view eliminates the subjective point of view. As I see it, we may always speak of an intersubjective starting point. Mimetic theory presupposes a subject whose mal ontologique leads to the adoption of models, without which it is impossible to define one's objectives of desire. Let me reiterate the centrality of the other in determining the self, the lack of being that defines the mimetic subject. We should emphasize Girard's radicality. The mimetic subject does not invite an ontological investment, but rather a phenomenological approach. If I'm not wrong, the concept I proposed of collective interdividuality makes it possible to tie together the two ends of Shihar's thought, establishing a complex but, at least to me, clear line of continuity between Monsange Romantique, uh, Verité Romanesque, and Achevé Clausewitz. While in the first work, the dimension of mimetic desire led to, con to conflict at the in individual level, by the second book, Archive Clausewitz, the escalation of violence is sparked by the transnational transmission of mimetic rivalry. Uh, and this mimetic rivalry is seen to engulf two major economic and, and military powers in the 19th century, France and Germany. This ri rivalry, says Girard, led the world to its present state with the almost exclusive preponderance of internal mediation. A Latin American gaze may lend particular strength to Girard's affirmation, since the end point for his reflections has been the jumping off point for art and thought in Latin American cultures, to wit, collective interdividuality. This unexpected intersection between Girard's theory 
in the, the very shaping of Latin American cultures has not yet been adequate, adequate, adequately pointed. Before moving, on, moving forward, one important point should be highlighted. I point, uh, I'm, I'm not proposing an essentialistic understanding of Latin America. I rather plan to bring out underlying structural affinities, or to put it in more theoretically ambitious terms, I plan to introduce elements that structure non-hegemonic strategies, and these, of course, in any latitude. Latin American vicissitudes are not unique nor univocal. As they relate to dilemmas, much like those, those seen under a, a variety of historical circumstances. Here, what I'm trying to do is to critically reconstruct the broader process of globalization at work since the late 15th century. Ontological vocabulary relating to a hypothetical essence should be cast aside. In its place, we may identify strategies that make it possible to tackle the growing asymmetries of the world system. Hence, the deliberately plural form. I always refer in the book to Latin American cultures. From an aesthetic and literary productive, the problem of collective individuality has been dealt with productively. The most important Latin American writers, artists, were able to, to take the, the dilemma that so often paralyzed philosophers, the dilemma of depending upon the other, and the artists turn it into a stimulus. The fact of necessarily depending on others, of being unable to escape their influence, and let's use the, the taboo word, the fact of being unable to escape their influence helped bring, bringing about the emergence of the poetics of emulation, as I propose to call it, replacing the anxiety of influence theorized by Harold Bloom and, and Jackson Bates with the certainty of the productivity of influence as imagined by Oswald de Andrade. Arthur Rimbaud's famous declaration, Je et un autre, is the fullest translation of the most compelling realizations in Latin American art. To be another, to convert this paradox into invention, mimetic art par excellence, and at the same time, a Latin American experience par définition. And I can only hope that the irony of the eternal return is fully appreciated by you, defining what belongs to Latin America with Arthur Rimbaud's words, more or less like identifying Shakespearean cultures or tracing the poetics of emulation, the last concept I proposed this morning. The poetics of emulation, it is my hypothesis, was honed, honed through Shakespearean cultures with their hypersensitivity to the gaze of the other, a theoretically absolute model that therefore could not be disputed. The theoretical framework proposed here adds the concept of Shakespearean cultures to the idea of a poetics of emulation. In both cases, I seek to expand, to expand on the challenge of my Mises, made even keener by the emergence of the world system in the modern era. Shakespeare, Shakespearean cultures, in general, grew out of non-hegemonic environments. What I seek to understand is the worldview of those cultures and the procedures of the poetics of emulation. This is the concern behind the project of a poetics of emulation as being characteristic of Shakespearean cultures, a poetics articulated in situations of asymmetrical power dynamics. This strategy includes an array of procedures employed by intellectuals, writers, and artists who find themselves on the less fortunate side of such exchanges, be they cultural, political, or economic. The poetics of emulation is an attempt to grapple 
with a concrete political situation, to wit, the objectively unequal status of those who write in Portuguese or in Spanish as opposed to those whose works circulate in English. French had occupied this status to the end of World War II. Before then, Latin had been the lingua franca of the European intellectual realm. This is, therefore, a historical phenomenon, making it a changeable one. But what does not seem to shift is the existence of a dominant language, the mouthpiece for polit political forces. Antonio de Nebrija, in the emblematic year of 1492, as he dedicated his Grammatica de la Lengua Castellana to the Catholic monarchs, summarized the phenomenon with strengths, said Antonio de Nebrija, que siempre la lengua fue compañera del imperio. The habit was indeed an old one. The notion of culture always implies its opposite, barbarism. Let us then return to Homer. In the second book of the Iliad, the Carians, allies of the Tro Trojans, are set aside with the careful use of an adjective, then created by Homer, parabarophonos. As the specialists have explained, this word plays with the onomatopoeia of bar, bar, which like our blah, blah, suggests empty discourse or completely unintelligible speech. To put it simply, barbarophonos designated all, all those who didn't speak fluent Greek, or all, ultimate, ultimately, all those unable to express themselves in elegant Athenian ethic. This onomatopoeic, onomatopoeic recourse, incidentally, had already come in hand for Babylonians, who, anticipating Homer's usage, referred, referred to foreigners as barbaru, the same principle, barbarophonos, barbaru. In a metonymic derivation, while barbaros became the body of an absence, barbarism became an absolute distance from culture. This digression may have taken me too far, I agree, but the topic is fascinating. After all, for the Mexican thinker, José Vasconcelos, in his autobiography, Ulysses Criollo, the real barbarians are those who only speak their own language. <laughs> the poetics of emulation translates the necessary presence of a mediator into a particularly productive literary and artistic form, wherein we find, if you allow me, novelistic truth on the realm of cultural history, as opposed to the romantic lie dominant throughout 19th century European cultural history. In this case, in the case of the novelistic truth of the Latin American cultural circumstance, there simply can be no typically Hegelian narrative of the reappropriation of the spirit. There is no spirit to be reappropriated given the collective interdividuality, the lack of being, the mal ontologique experienced on the collective level. The most economic way of clarifying the anachronistic appropriation of the classical concept of emulatio may be to recall the dilemma faced by Domingo Faustino Sarmiento in his exile in Chile, the Argentinian intellectual who later became president of Argentina. How to go about finding buyers for El Progreso, the newspaper Sarmiento was editing in Chile? Sarmiento was putting the newspaper together by cherry picking the most significant news items and uh, the most relevant articles from foreign publications. Sarmiento uh, would actually produce a sort, a sort of updated collage of the latest newspapers. 
the difficulty was the following. How to compete with the periodicals, with the newspapers, whose coverage was more up-to-date and whose points of view shaped the readers' receptions. Under these circumstances, how to win over subscribers for El Progreso if the other European and North American newspapers were available and even got to Santiago de Chile first before the appearance of El Progreso? Why would anyone wait for a compilation of news articles and the transcription of opinion pieces if the public had access to the texts in their original languages and could simply sidestep Sarmiento's creative translations? Sarmiento's answers, Sarmiento's answer to all these questions was exemplary. Far more than just uh, a remark, a historical remark, it reveals a structural element that remains to be better discussed. And this structural element illuminates the impact of the poetics of emulation terms of cultural politics. So Sarmiento finally writes an editorial trying to convince Chilean readers to finally buy El Progreso, and says Sarmiento. On this score, our new newspaper outdoes the best known in Europe and America for the quite obvious reason that, being one of the last newspapers in the world, we have at our disposition to select from the best possible way all that the other papers have already published. In the realm of aesthetics and thinking, the last shall be the first as they can pick and choose what they find most interesting from the whole of the tradition. Emulation is the most sophisticated form of flattery. Hence, the reiteration of the theme sheds light on the target to imagine strategies for dealing with the constitutive presence of a model accepted as an authority and adopted as the form by which to determine collective individuality. The paradox implicit in the historical experience of secondarity is the foremost leitmotif in the definition, in the self-definition of Latin American cultures, to define themselves through the other's gaze. The power of the poetics of, of emulation shines through, shines through here. It turns secondarity into an unexpected reserve of potential strength as one moves from programmatic imitation toward the goal of attaining inventive emulation. The poetics of emulation, therefore, must be understood as a strategy developed in situations of asymmetrical power relations. This strategy takes in an array of procedures employed by artists, intellectuals, writers, placed at the, at the less favored side of such exchanges, whether they be cultural, political, or economic in nature. The poetics of emulation is an intellectual, artistic approach which tries to deal with the situation of ob objective inequality. This is the test of the poetics of emulation within the realm of Shakespearean cultures and the predicament of collective interdividuality. Or at least, this is the fiction which I have lived by in the past five years. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep uh, questions and discussion until after. Uh, yeah, of course. Second presentation. And now it's my honor to introduce my old friend, Carlos Mendoza, with whom I've been hanging around since the early 1980s, with whom I share a novice master. Yeah. Some years <laughs> ago. The, the director of, <laughs> yes, a long, long time ago. He's the director of humanities of the Iberoamericana University in uh, Mexico City. He's a member of the Board of Concilium, the uh, international <laughs> Catholic Review, author of many books, 
and I'm very much looking forward to what he has to say today. Thank you, James. Um, thank you, um, Angel Barahona, Uncover Community, I would say, community, because of this invitation to this seminar. It's the first time I come here. And um, I'll try to link this reflection on literature and um, imitation to the political sense and epistemological sense of mimetical theory. And uh, my presentation is, um, well, uh, it's called Latin American Subjectivations in the Midst of Global War, a dialogue about mimetic theory and the epistemologies of the South. Um, half a century has been a brief time in the history of ideas, but good enough for the discussion of some key concepts proposed by René Girard. The dialogue about the human condition and his mimetic desire, marked by the sacrificial mechanisms, has arrived to different universities around the world, but not only universities, also social movements. Although modern philosophical anthropology and social anthropology have already suggested the conflictive nature of the intersubjectivity, especially from the dialectic of the master and the slave in Hegel, they had not analyzed in this perspective um, that integrated uh, comparate literature with the phenomenology of subjectivity and biblical theology as proposed with original audacity by the thinker of Avignon. Let's talk a little bit about how mimetic theory has been received in Latin America. Twelve years ago, and here we, I have the pictures of the, my colleagues, <laughs> Some years ago, you can see they look younger. <laughs> well, René Girard is in the middle. Twelve years ago, disciples of René Girard, uh, such as Joao César de Castro, Rocha, and James Allison, invited a Latin American interdisciplinary group to think the, the question about violence as mechanism of social exclusion. It was an interesting call from an important academic journal in Colombia, and Roberto Salarte is here from the Javeriana University in Bogota, given in the context of narcotraffic wars, which today seems to extend in a sort of mimetic logic on a global scale as a catejon that even René Girard could not fully analyze. In Latin America, there have been four important conferences and more, but four I would like to talk about on mimetic theory. One, the first one in Bogota, second in Sao Paulo, and then in San Cristobal de las Casas, Chiapas, Mexico, and a fourth one again in Mexico City. They have served uh, to open the discussion about the mechanism of mimetic theory and mimetic rivalry focused on the problem of social, cultural, political and patriarchal relations that manifest in a systematic way in the postmodern and globalized world. Other regional and national meetings have been taking place in South America. All this has brought about a good number of academic publications, such as the 30 titles in the Girard Library, published by Realizaciones in Sao Paulo, as well as other many other books and several articles in the different academic journals, especially in Universitas Filosofica in the Javerian University and the Iberoamericano University in Mexico City. During these three decades of conference and symposia about mimetic theory in Latin America, one of the central topics has been the social pertinence of this theory for the understanding of the phenomenon of violence that uh, tear the tejido social, that's a Spanish expression of community of sense, in the continent, as well as its possible ways of resolving the different conflicts, especially in Colombia. Roberto Solarte has been working a lot on the reconciliation, starting from mimetic theory. Some statistics can illustrate the magnitude of the uprising up to the extremes, or la monteos extreme, of violence in Latin America. In the last uh, 50 years, many countries in Latin America have gone from dictatorial regimes with thousands of dead and disappeared persons to fake democracies that are dominated by the mediocracia, as Enrique Duces called the new media, the manipulation of public opinion by the interests of the bourgeoisie, along with the logic of accumulation and plunder. Territorial conflicts, particularly with the native peoples of the continent, uh, 
is about um, is without a doubt the clearest example of this international distribution of territories as a logic of financial fascism <laughs> of global liberal capitalism. In recent decades, systemic victims have multiplied faces today, but they are all expressions of the necropower uh, and necropolitical that dominate the region and the planet. Those territorial conflicts, particularly with the native peoples of the continent, from the, uh, Chile to uh, Canada and Alaska, is without doubt the clearest example of this international distribution of territories as a ma major example of the violent logic of financial fascism of global liberal capitalism. Um, this necropower is a, a specific concept of uh, Achille Membe, the Cameroonese uh, thinker, uh, is a very important category to discuss with mimetic theory, it seems to me. And I would like to propose that in this uh, session. Uh, some ideas are from uh, Achille Membe. A late uh, modern colonial occupation is a con concatenation of multiple powers, disciplinary, biopolitical, and necropolitical. The combination of the three allocates to the colonial power an absolute domination over the inhabitants of the occupied territories. The state of siege uh, is itself a military institution. It allows a modality of killing that those not distinguish between the external and the internal enemy. Entire populations are the target of the sovereign. The besieged village and towns are sealed off and cut off from the world. Daily life is militarized. Freedom is given to local military commanders to use their discretion as to when and whom to shoot. Movement between the territorial cells requires formal permits, and local civil institutions are systematically destroyed. The besieged population is deprived of their means of income. Invisible killing is added to outright executions. Some ideas that uh, declares the new ways of global violence. Um, what's next? Um, there are the, there, um, these possible people of society that do not fit in the logic of industrial production, whose work and whose bodies are treated as junk because they hinder uh, the development of a system of concentrations of the wealth of global capital. Um, Here's the studies of mimetic theory from Latin America cannot focus only on the exegesis of, the, of a great author like René Girard, since they face the epistemic and ethical imperative of thinking how to deactivate the sacrificial logic associated with the necropower. That's it, sorry. <coughs> so, um, we would like then to emphasize the multiple resistances by which these systematic victims or systemic victims are changing the course of history from below and from the reverse. And uh, let's quote uh, Franz Fanon, another thinker from uh, epistemologists of the South. The colonization, therefore, implies the urgent need to truly challenge the colonial situation. Its definition can, if we want to describe it accurately, be summed up in the well-known words, the last shall be first. The colonization is verification of this. At a descriptive level, therefore, any decolonization is a success. So, from our perspective, it's absolutely necessary to decolonize the mimetic theory by listening to the critical thinking of the South and allowing a deep debate about the fundamental concepts. Let me point out some of these points. First, the conception of the human condition with its ambivalent mimetic desire but sustained by a sense of belonging to the earth, which is the founding experience of many native cultures. The communal perspective of many communities beyond an individualistic approach 
and vision predominated in the West, especially in its technoscientific version. Fourth, the urgency of a sapiential knowledge of the real that includes science and technology but within the limits of sentipensar, what the different philosophers from Latin America call uh, the buen vivir, the reason of the heart, listing the reason, the heart more than the reason of the mind. Fourth, the spiritual sense of existence and knowledge of, of the real, marked by the communal, communal feast, the experience of the non-objectivistic condition of the world in the work of the earth, and the sense of, of affective and cordial care of the relationships that sustain people and communities with the source of life. Um, it uh, means that the mimetic theory has then new challenges that comes from the experience and thinking of the peoples of this global south. It has to explore new territories of the mechanism of desire, rivalry and sacrifice, but on a collective scale. And that's why the idea of uh, collective individuality developed by Joao Cesar is very useful for us. In, the, in this context, uh, if for Girard, the idea of, of interdividuality is a major concept that has to do with the mechanism of a triangular desire and its possible ways of overcoming Saturn's lie, for Latin American mimetic thought, it is a matter of considering the subjectivations in their collective dimension lived, among others by the original peoples and by the social movements of victims, uh, especially the victims of war. For instance, in my country, in the, ten, ten, the last 10 years, we have had 10,000 people killed and 50,000 people disappeared, more than the war in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan together. Um, considering the, the subjectivation in this, this collective dimension lived, among others, by the original peoples and by the social movements of victims, they are trying to understand and to change the situation of violence. The non-violent approach of most of these social movements, or, or movements of systemic vi victims, as at uh, the time of late, late modernity, like in Brazil, landless workers movement, or the Mapuche movement in Chile, the Zapatista movement in Mexico, and the Central American mothers in search of their missing immigrant children, to quote a few examples, converge all of them to recognize the framework of postmodern fascism that subjects bodies and territories to the logic of systemic violence. Violence is not only a question of individualistic approach, but this is a systemic problem. Like Jean-Pierre Dupuy raised that issue in uh, Mexico some years ago. So this neoliberal capitalism has, has a colonial epistemic impact even a patriarchal, also, violence. A first element in the Latin American mimetic thought has proposed to put more emphasis to the sacrificial logic to this, this systemic violence as a transverse axis in order to have more vision and capacity to dismantle the processes of subjectivation that generate all those multiple exclusions. A second element in the Latin American mimetic thought are the nonviolent movements as examples of defense of the territory, such as the territory of the Mother Earth, La Madre Tierra, that the indigenous people safeguard against the big corporation. The epistemic territory is another territory of violence that public universities defend against the logic of the neoliberal market with their fi financing agencies and local governments uh, that carry out new international distribution of knowledge. And the University of Rio de Janeiro is one of those examples. The territory of women's bodies that look for autonomy and equity, and in a more discreet but growing way, territories of spiritualities that were kidnapped by the institutional religions, according to the Puerto Rican theologian Margarita Sanchez de Leon. That also another kind of systemic violence. 
And all these kind of violence are often caught in the sacrificial logic in the relationship with transcendence. A third element of this approach of Latin American violence is a Latin American subjectivation has to do with the communal sense of reconciliation. That is a reconciliation that passes through a deep ex exercise of collective memory. We need to know what it happened for all those people who, will be, who have been killed or disappeared. The exercise of transitional and restorative justice, which is absolutely necessary for reconciliation. And the restoration of, of tejido social or community. It is a long and complex process that goes from visibilization of victims, which is the first step to resolve violence, to the involvement of executioners and perpetrators in a course of social, political, and spiritual conversion. Probably the movement of victims in Colombia could be a good example of this last part of reconciliation. A third part of my uh, exposition, New Horizon for Mimetic Theory in the Global South. As a contribution to the mimetic theory in its relation to diverse settings and contexts in the global village, I want to propose some ideas from the epistemologies of the South, as I said, as a working framework to think of the violence, the memory, and the reconciliation in dialogue with, with mimetic theory. The expression of global South denotes a reality that encompasses the systemic victims of any region of the planet in terms of critical thinking represented by Trans Fanon, Boaventura de Sousa Santos, Achille Membe, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui in Bolivia. These do not refer to any new theory of victims, something that would result in a sort of another victimization for considering them as passive. Instead, the Global South emphasizes the multiple resistances by which these systemic victims are changing the course of history from below and from the reverse of history. I would like to quote Franz Fanon again, what I said before. The colonization implies the urgent need to thoroughly challenge the colonial situation. Its definition can if we want to describe it accurately, be summed up in the well-known words, the last shall be first. The colonization is verification of this. At a descriptive level, therefore, any decolonization is a success." End of quote. So from my perspective, it's necessary to decolonize mimetic theory, as I said before, by listening in the critical thinking of the South and allowing a deep debate about the fundamental concept of rivalry, desire, and sacrifice. So the conception of the human condition with its ambivalent mimetic desire is absolutely necessary, but link it to the belonging to the earth, which is the founding experience of many native cultures, not only inter-individual, between individuals, but with Mother Earth. So we think mimetic desire according to this anthropology and cosmology. Second, the communal, per communal perspective of many communities beyond an individualistic approach and a vision dominated in the West, especially in its techno-scientific version. The urgency of uh, recovering, rediscovering a sapiential knowledge of the real that includes science and technology, but within the limits of senti pensar, the buen vivir, the reason of the heart, and the reason of the mind. And can we restore our own identities with this other approach, not only a Western approach of individual? And fourth, the spiritual sense of existence and the knowledge of the real marked by the communal feast uh, the uh, experience of the non-objectivistic condition of the world in the work of the earth, in the sense of affective and cordial care of the relationship that sustain people and communities with the source of life. So some conclusions in order to continue the discussion this in this session. <coughs> 
Um, and that the American mimetic thought is now an indispensable voice in the knowledge of the process of subjectivation proper to late modern times in the global south. I think we cannot ignore this other approach. The path of such intellectual, ethical, political, and spiritual adventure that we can travel together from diverse cultural context will be crucial to achieve the pertinence of an interpretation of the world that seeks ways of overcoming violence as survivors. We all are survivors of uh, any kind of violence, of an uprising of violence that defies humanity and the planet. That's the way I think the mimetic theory in Latin America has been a creative reception of René Girard's thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks to the admirable way in which both speakers have kept so well to time. <laughs> we now have plenty of opportunity to discuss. So please. Thank you, Professor Carlos Mendoza. My question is for you. You quoted twice uh, Franz Fanon. You quoted twice Franz Fanon. Yeah. Also. Now, as so far I, as I am good informed, these men justify the use of violence. As so far I am good informed. And there is in Belgium an activist of the Islam, Abu Jaja, and there is only this part of your uh, speech, because globally I found it very good. But this man, Abu Jaja, made the self uh, speech of you. He said, the Islam is colonized people. This is the last, and we will become the first. And we have the right to use violence and to meet violence. Therefore, what do you think about this? And he quote also Franz Fanon. <coughs> Should we have several, <coughs> several questions first? Other takers? Sam. Jean, I, I wanted to uh, uh, compliment you on your work on Shakespeare. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a genuine advance, the poetics of emulation, genuine advance on mimetic theory with regard to Rene. I mean, and, you know, in the early seminars when Rene would talk about Shakespeare, uh, it was always the appropriation, it was straight from Hegel in some ways without the object. It was the appropriation of the desire of the other. So one would look out at the world. A, a, we could call that a kind of mimesis of the subject, so to speak. But what you're talking about is a further advance on that, which is a kind of a mimesis of the object. That is to say, it's not only the subjectivity of the other that I appropriate, but I appropriate specifically the other's view of me. And it, gi it gives actually additional meaning to the line that Rene always loved and really got him started, which was from Midsummer Night's Dream, oh hell, to choose love by another's eyes. I would rather my father, this is Hermia, choose by my eyes. And I, I, I always thought, okay, Rene, it, it, there's a bit of nemesis, but it seems to me you have, you have nailed exactly what is going on there that is to say what she's objecting to is that she is getting cast in a certain way and she would rather have her father be cast to her so the doubles get created by this sense of double uh, emulation so I, I, I think you're, you're doing great work yeah. uh, I would like to ask you dear Carlos uh, how do you think that uh, Javier Sicilia I would like to ask you, how do you think Javier Sicilia and the movement for peace with justice and dignity in Mexico <coughs> has helped the colonize uh, mimetic theory, if at all? Well, let's start with those three. Which yeah, okay. You? Would you like to go oh, first? Well, about Franz Fanon, um, obviously he was living in a um, context of, um, uh, well, extremely violent context and uh, slavery so yeah indeed he sometimes he proposed some violence as a um, medium for uh, liberation as other thinkers in the history of uh, western and eastern culture i remember thomas aquinas talking about uh, the right of war 
uh, even Francisco de Vitoria, the patron of this university, also spoke about that concerning the, the right of the peoples who have been um, conquered by the Spaniards to be independent. So um, it's not the violence the starting point, in uh, my sense, um, for these thinkers, especially Fanon, but uh, the way to um, re-understand the history from the other side, not only from the point of view of the perpetrator or the conqueror, but from the slaves. And that's why it's, it's absolutely necessary for him to um, overcome and trying to go beyond this structural violence. So I'm not I, do, I don't agree absolutely uh, with him in this strategy of violence, but sometimes it's, it's necessary in order to uh, change uh, a situation of social uh, and structural uh, injustice. Yes. And just this distinction. So the, the, for me, the, the principal idea, uh, which is important now from Fanon, is uh, the idea of decolonizing this epistemical colonization, which is the basis of the military and the economical oppression, first of all. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. Um, I think that there is a use in a lot of groups who consider why we are the victims, and they use the same epistemologic uh, model as you. What do you think of the use of this model in Islam, yeah. for instance? Well, I think it is important because it is a mimetic use of a certain model. Yeah, that's my question. I think that we need absolutely um, distinguish in every author and theory the elements who could be important for our context. And so uh, Franz Fanon and Achille Membe, for instance, are the Cameroonese thinker who is teaching in Johannesburg. Um, they are very um, clear about how it is important to go beyond the structural violence which provokes systemic victims. Jean-Pierre Jean Dupuy has developed this idea in San Cristobal, Mexico, in this colloquium with the Zapatistas uh, thinkers. I mean, the Zapatistas is a movement of indigenous people who um, um, had a rebellion in 92 in southern Mexico, and they have uh, free territories not uh, where the government, federal government, is not allowed to be present. And so mm, all of them, this, those thinkers, are trying to um, create a framework, an epistemological framework, to understand how to stop structural violence. And that's, for me, the most important thing. I don't agree with them or with those who propose a rebellion, military rebellion, or violence. But I think this is not essential for the position, and that's why I'm trying to discuss and dialogue with them. And especially at that time, I remember for five years ago in San Cristobal Las Casas, we were discussing, and it was a very difficult point. They, they said, the um, uh, thinkers of uh, this uh, movement, Zapatista movement, that sometimes it's absolutely necessary a kind of violence to stop violence um, in sense of uh, not a war because they're very weak actually uh, in this uh, in the military sense but a kind of resistance trying to stop slavery or feminicides uh, and so on and justice is absolutely necessary there I'm not justifying violence I'm just trying to say that in some situation the context allows to s certain communities to uh, propose some strategies to avoid more violence. And I would like to, uh, also to link this um, question with the, the other one. Javier Sicilia is a, a poet, uh, a writer, a Mexican poet, who, um, whose, whose son was killed five years ago by the drug cartels. And he uh, became a leader of a very important movement of victims. Uh, more than 100,000 people have been killed, as I said, in the last 10 years in Mexico, and 50,000 disappeared. Um, and Javier Sicilia is a kind of a moral and a spiritual leader of this movement, inspired especially by Ivan Illich, 
uh, also by the community of the Arca, and René Girard also, because he is an intellectual, a Catholic intellectual, who is trying to go um, with the victims, accompanying them, trying to listen to their suffering and to learn from the resistances what to do against violence. So the um, uh, interdividual, collective interdividuality for me is an example there how a movement, social movement of victims can restore the social uh, the social structure, social relationships through non-violence. They explicitly, and that's a big difference, uh, said that non-violence is the only way to go beyond the Monteos extreme. But sometimes uh, this experience uh, has uh, very different challenges. Uh, I mean, uh, they try to uh, discuss with the federal government for a new law for victims, and they were absolutely manipulated by the government in a political context. So they tried to fight again and again, as familiars of these people disappeared or kidnapped or killed, trying to seek for justice, do not forget their names, trying to find their bodies, telling their stories, and asking for justice and probably, but only probably, reconciliation. Reconciliation is not a starting point. <coughs> Could be an horizon in order to rebuild social community. But reconciliation is, is still an utopia. But this movement, I think, at that, uh, thank you, Juan Manuel, for this question. Javier Sicilia, for me, is uh, trying to decolonize mimetic theory, listed in the victims. Uh, starting from this experience of why they feel, why they think, how they organize their resistances to uh, avoid more and more violence. Thank you. <coughs> Would you like to say <coughs> for me. Just a brief remark. Uh, many thanks, Sandra, for your very generous reading. I'm afraid I was not able to read it properly because I have a terrible code. So I'm, I thank you tremendously for having made an effort to understand through my reading. I'm just taking advantage to pinpoint one feature that I have tried to develop as much as possible in this new book. A at first, uh, I was struck, but then we all, we all, by the sheer fact that in non-hegemonic circumstances, and I have proposed to replace the concepts of center and periphery by the notions of hegemonic and non-hegemonic, because usually the concepts of center and periphery, usually they translate themselves into spatial metaphors, given a certain notion of stability and fixed, fixity that precisely I think the way I understand Henri Girard's thinking is a fluent, dynamic, always changing thinking. I, I, I was particularly enchanted by your characterization yesterday. And I, I think I understood it uh, from a strong point, viewpoint that there is no ethics in Jihar in the sense of proposing established concepts. What you do have is a structure of thinking, is a mental mechanism that allows you to shift different positions all the time. And then, uh, inspired by this understanding of mimetic theory, I have proposed to call hegemonic and non-hegemonic circumstances. A very simple example, I think, uh, perhaps enlightens the possibility of this change. <coughs> <coughs> there is a fundamental book to me when I was, I was starting this, this project. It was Joachim de Belez, 1549, De France et Illustration de la Langue Française. As everybody knows, this, uh, there was, uh, Dubelet was a member of the Pléiad, and he writes this authentic manifesto to prove to the French cit to his uh, uh, French citizens that French as a language was as noble as Latin and Greek, that therefore it was possible to write philosophy and lyrical poetry in French, and above all, epics. And uh, then Joachim de Belay says, and this is his argument, that the French should do as the Latins had done with the Greek. And he literally, he literally says, in other words, we should nourish 
we should digest them and you should come up with a new French. But then, of course, in the, in the 16th century, French is an, in a no hegemonic position vis a vis Latin, because Latin is the lingua franca. But then, in the 19th century, up to the Second World War, French would become the absolute Latin of intellectual life. So, hegemonies change. And so that's why I have proposed to call hegemonic and no hegemonic circumstances. But then I was struck by the fact that uh, it's always you have a pattern. Whenever in a no hegemonic circumstance, from the very beginning of the 19th century on, whenever you need to appropriate a work, whenever, whenever you have to rethink yourself on a collective level, there is a name that is always there, Shakespeare. It can be, for instance, in the Francophone decolonization movement with Émile Césaire rewriting The Tempest as Une Tempête. It can be Brazil when in 1928 someone proposed a cannibalist manifesto <laughs> to propose that precisely cultural cannibalism, and I have brought together cultural cannibalism and mimetic theory, because in both cases we, you have this subject that is above all uh, uh, defined by this mal ontologique. And then what I, I have finally, I think, come up to understand is the reason why in non-hegemonic circumstances Shakespeare has always been appropriated, always. And the Tempest, naturally, has become the key play. I, I, as we know, you taught me language, and my prophet on it is, I know how to curse. <laughs> uh, but then, what I, I think that I, what I have proposed in this book is that uh, what really is at stake here is a deep structural affinity between Shakespeare's method of composition and the non-hegemonic circumstance. In other words, if you are, let's say, a novelist in Brazil or in Mexico in the 19th century, you cannot write a novel if you have not read properly Quixote, of course, but the English tradition of the 18th century, the French great realist tradition of the 19th century, some Russian, and at least you must know some of the Bildungsroman. In other words, if you are a Brazilian or a Mexican novelist, you cannot, you only write because you have read. And you have read a lot. And that's why eventually you write something. <laughs> uh, but then, this is Shakespeare's method of composition. Out of the 37 plays written by Shakespeare, according to the specialists, and I do not claim myself to be a Shakespearean at all. 37. 37, that's what I said. Out of the 37, only four have, so to speak, an original plot. And even those four, as The Tempest, there is something fascinating that, as everybody knows, Shakespeare's character is speak like Montaigne. <laughs> so even in an original plot, Shakespeare writes what I would call a collage text. So the, the poetics of emulation was actually created by Shakespeare in that sense. And that then I have provocatively proposed that the first Latin American writer is called William Shakespeare. <laughs> I mean, and then that's the idea, this, is structural, this deep structural affinity in the method of composition. So uh, you, you reminded us of the uh, uh, look through someone else's eyes, but there's also this beautiful formula, falling in love through hear saying. <laughs> and in a certain sense, Latin American authors have always fallen in love with themselves through someone, someone else's eyes. And then what I'm trying to propose in this book, I'm trying to uncover this structural affinity between Shakespeare as a writer, Shakespeare's method of composition, with a non-hegemonic circumstance. And I thank you a lot for your generous observation. Well, I, yeah, no, I'd like to uh, say something. Uh, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned the word secondarity. This is a wonderful word, uh, because I think that it's, uh, um, <coughs> I think it's the modern way in which we can describe something that actually can't be described uh, mm without pious language, because it's the virtue of humility, quite literally, in the, <coughs> the recognition that we are all, always, <coughs> second. 
is the commission a possibility for creativity? That's it. Uh, uh, and I, so I, I was really very pleased, very pleased to hear that. I want to, to thank you for that. I think a... No, thank you. Uh, this has been a wonderful morning for me. You, you should always invite me, so people will be very kind, as kind as they are today. Because uh, this was a, a neologism created as a concept. In Portuguese, secundidade. Mm -hmm. There isn't this word in Portuguese. Right. And my editor in Brazil said, you cannot write secundidade. I said, why? There isn't such a word. I said, that's precisely why. <laughs> and that's precisely the concept, secondarity. Mm -hmm. And then the poetics of emulation translates secondarity okay. into creativity. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I reckon that we are at time. <coughs> we're on time for our break. So thank you very, very much indeed to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.